Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and hello there, everybody. I have a special guest. He is part of our podcast community. He has his own podcast on the show, and it's Sander Van Stee, and he is the owner and founder of Moral Eats. Today, he'd like to discuss what a healthy diet is, and he's going to go into depth about a lot of different topics that affect our lives health-wise. So, Sander, why don't you take it away and let everybody know a little about yourself and the topic we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, as far as a healthy diet, it's something that I've uh, invested in personally because uh, I struggle with my own health. And also financially, is um, producing food is what I do for a living. So I grew up on a dairy farm, and and now we are in the process of trying to transition that farm to regenerative practices. So right now, the dairy that we produce is still part of the commercial market, but we have the grass-fed beef, we have pasture turkeys and pasture pork, and we also sort of some wild seafood. And so like that, that's, uh, that's, that's the food side of what we're producing. But then also like... Around the time, like originally, I never really thought much about regenerative agriculture. And, and to be honest, I was fairly set in my ways. Um, we had a successful dairy business, so um, why why change anything really? We had we had a, a business that worked, and the the motivation for all this change that I'm trying to create in our farm, but in agriculture as a whole, really kick started with my own health issues because. Uh, my testosterone basically disappeared and I got really tired, really weak. My libido disappeared and it had a massive impact on me, as you could probably imagine. I was 25 years old and I had no testosterone. And it had me questioning everything as far as like my health choices, the healthcare system, which wasn't really able to help me besides just prescribing me with hormone replacement therapy. And then it also had me questioning the way we farm, which... I was really focused and interested on animal welfare because I just love working with animals. So I wanted to kind of find a way to give back to these animals, but it also led me towards regenerative agriculture. And, and um, that's why we're, that's how, that's what got us to the road that we're heading down now. But like in that time, it took me six years to refine and, and rebuild my health to the point where I can now start I can now produce my own hormones again. And in that six year period, I've tried absolutely everything as far as, and, and I was very, very strict and very um, motivated and, and uh, very consistent with these habits that I try to add to my life because I had a really strong motivational factor, like a low testosterone. It sucked. It was, it was tough. It was tough in my relationships. It was tough just to get through an average day because my body hurt so much. Um, I basically turned into an old man at 25. So I I tried diet wise, I've tried most diets like um, and in researching all the different diets that are out there. The one thing that they all have in common is that you should eat more whole foods and get rid of processed foods. So no matter what people are eating, that is basically, in my opinion, the golden rule. That's like that's the main thing that people need to focus on is get the processed junk out of your diet and just eat whole foods, foods that are, are in the perimeter of your grocery store, foods that grow from the ground or from something that eats what grows from the ground and and just like just real plain food. And that's where basically everybody needs to start. And that's basically the foundation of any healthy diet. And I think any any sort of health guru, no matter what side of what type of fad diet that they promote would agree with that rule. Yeah. So that's where we need to start. But then for me, I, I, when I first got sick, that's when the vegan movement was in its heyday. And, <laughs> and when you do any sort of research on there about health, that's all that I was able to find back then. And I'm open-minded to a fault. So I gave it a try, despite the fact that I produce dairy products for a living. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I tried eating whole foods, vegan diet, and and I didn't just dabble in it. Like I I did it I did it right by all definitions of people that are educating people to eat this way. It's like I I had lots of beans. I really focus on proteins and and healthy fats from from plant sources. Lots of beans, lots of seeds, and and nuts and avocados. And I also really focused on <clears throat> some of the more energy dense, high high more like caloric sources of whole food, lots of potatoes and, um, and 
And despite that, as time went on, I started getting more and more food sensitivities. Started off with me being sensitive to dairy and then and eggs. And then it, over time, I got more and more. Like I started reacting to sulfites. I started reacting to gluten. And like and this, the list kept kept growing. Like certain scents, even like certain smells, uh, would, would cause cause a, a cause a reaction. And I was like, something must be wrong because I've been very strict and very eating this ideal diet um, by by these standards by the that are basically proposed by the whole plant food community and. I feel like my body is just getting more and more sensitive, is getting more and more irritated, and my digestion is getting worse and worse. So that's when I started adding in different amounts, like started adding more and more whole forms of animal products. And one of the things that was great is I was able to start consuming dairy again because I was eating raw dairy. And raw dairy is very easy to digest, very digestible. And I was reacting to the lactose and to the proteins in milk. And neither of those things were an issue when mm -hmm. I assume raw dairy. So it's, it's a less processed form. So it's like, it's, and then also just more, more our, like we start eating a lot of our grass fed beef and a lot of our pastured turkeys and eating more and more meat consumption. And, and I basically slowly improved or slowly increased how much meat and animal products I consumed. And I basically by necessity, because one of the things I struggled to digest was fatty foods. So I couldn't eat a whole lot of meat at one point because it was too fatty and it upset, that would upset my stomach as well. So I, I slowly increased my meat consumption. So I basically tried from a whole food perspective, all the different possibilities of, of, of the amounts of whole plant, whole plant foods and whole animal foods. And I even went to the, like uh, recently tried the, uh, the whole extreme where it's just nothing but meat. Try that yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, but for me personally, um, I struggle to eat enough when I eat nothing but meat. Right. I, I find I, I'm able to eat more when I have a more varied diet, especially fruit. But basically now I, I feel really, really good when I eat not just whole foods, but whole foods that are really digestible and all the nutrients are bioavailable. So right. it's just, yeah, it's a lot easier on my digestion and I feel a lot better. I'm never bloated anymore and I'm very consistent um, in, in every way, shape, or form. And uh, that's how I personally feel best. But like, I strongly believe that as far as um, how much plant foods or how much animal foods people should eat, it really, I think there's some individual variation there. I don't, I'm not comfortable saying that everybody should eat the same things. Uh, we're all different. So as I think it's pretty safe to say we should eat whole foods, but then beyond that, you should try for yourself. And be very weary to not become dogmatic in your beliefs. Because the trick is, like, if you eat whole foods, you will feel better. Mm -hmm. But you don't know. And, like, and then because you feel better, you can say, this is the best way to eat. And I'll eat this way for the rest of my life. But you, you don't know. Potentially, you could feel even better. And because you're being dogmatic and religious in your dietary choices, you're shutting yourself off from the possibility of feeling even better. So I, I would encourage people to not be dogmatic about their nutrition and just give it a try. See, see how you feel. Your body will speak to you as far as your energy levels and, your, and the way you're digesting foods and like your amount of vitality. And personally, I'm very interested in longevity. And to feel young, that's what, what vitality really is. Like when you have lots of strength and energy, that's basically what youth feels like. So if you're mm -hmm. able to feel youthful today, it's as you age, it'll slowly decrease from there. So it's, I think it's a very powerful um, indication of this is a, a good diet that'll help with vitality be, and, like, and longevity if you have a, a higher ceiling to start off with. So, right. so the way you feel today is, is a good indication. And that's what I think people should base their, their, their diet off of. And it could vary depending on where you live. And um, as far as like, and like, and also like what your heritage is. There's certain people that digest different foods differently. There's lots of factors in there. But um, yeah, if you try it out and you're not dogmatic, you, you'll be able to find out for yourself. I think it's pretty amazing. And one of the things I think is really amazing is that you mentioned that 
through your diet, you were able to get your hormones level balanced. And there's so many people out there that resort to hormone therapy or they resort to over-the-counter products and your whole, your whole body is run by hormones. So when your hormones are out of whack, you know, it changes the whole composition of your body, the way you feel, the way you act, everything gets affected. And it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's really important that you explain to the listeners how you actually um, changed your, your hormone levels and you got them more balanced, because that's something that many people, I mean, many people in the United States, Canada, worldwide struggle with. And to hear you talk about you know, the, your diet and how it, it affected your hormone balance would be great, because I think it really, that's something that so many people have you know, um, tried so many different things and there's so many products out there that promise so many different things, but you, how did you go about it naturally? Yeah. And to be fair, it wasn't only diet that I changed. Like I said, I, I stacked all sorts of healthy habits, but diet was definitely a massive mover for me. And I noticed after the fact, not necessarily during, um, but like I noticed that when I was eating hundred percent whole plant foods that I had an insatiable cravings for dark chocolate and i would eat 95 percent dark chocolate because i was trying to eat all whole foods and um, i found like i could eat a massive meal and i could be completely full and stuffed but my body i still crave chocolate and if i stayed in the house for too long and didn't head out to the barn and, and started work I, I would just keep eating this chocolate it was never safe and and i realized after the fact that chocolate is one of maybe two plant sources of saturated fat and it got me thinking because now when I'm eating, now that I eat a significant amount of animal whole foods, I don't have cravings. Chocolate could be sitting in the cupboard and I never touch it. I don't want it. I don't miss it. It's just it's the cravings aren't there. And it, it's it's amazing because I feel like my body is finally like at the point where like I'm getting everything that I, my body wants and needs because I don't have these cravings. Right. But yeah, so like saturated, I feel that the reason my body was craving saturated fat is that it, fat is not just energy. It's a building block as well as energy. Yeah. Like your body needs saturated fats and cholesterols and needs these healthy fats to, to create hormones. So like testosterone in my case, but any hormone really is usually started from, from cholesterol and your body builds those hormones from there. And then also like saturated fat, you, you need a lot of those fats for your cell walls for every cell in your body, the, sorry, not the cell wall, but the cell membrane. Yeah. Every cell in your body is, has a cell membrane that's, that's mostly fats and like, and every organelle within that cell is made with fats. Right. So it's, it's important that you don't just consider it energy, like carbohydrates, like you're, you can live without carbohydrates because there's no, there's no required nutrients. There's no building blocks that, that are required within the carbohydrates macronutrient. Whereas like, that's not the case for fats. Like there are, there are fats that are required, like your mm -hmm. DHA that but there's also this fat is just a building block in general so it's more than just energy it's like similar to protein where you need it to build up build up your body right and for your body to work well but yeah so like so that was one of the, the keys for me is like yeah, get rid of the junk get rid of the inflammatory foods foods that i was reacting to that causing all that all that stress and inflammation in my body so that my body could relax but I'd also give it the proper building blocks right. and like the whole foods are great for that in general, because you don't just hit your macronutrients. Whole foods are also great sources of your micronutrients. Right. So like that's also very important. But then yeah, for me, the the including more animal foods was an important part of it because it it calmed down my digestion because they were so digestible. But yeah, it, it's also just a more bioavailable, more um digestible form of those of the, of those same nutrients of those micronutrients so like that was a key part for me but then it's yeah it wasn't just the diet that i was changing over time i was also in introducing things like fasting and cold exposure and exercising and focusing on my sleep and and just my my overall stress levels i've tried meditation for a little while too but that didn't really make such an impact on me personally because i find if you look at what people say you should do to meditate, I basically do that to fall asleep every night. So I almost out of habit meditated, meditate every, every night, ever since I was a little kid. 
So that was impactful for me. But like the cold exposure, for example, did have a, a really big impact because like one of the things that you do is when you're exposed to cold is you're trying to calm your breathing and cause your and calm your stress response and relax under this exposure uh, under this extreme stress mm -hmm. and becoming that uh, allow me to become more aware of what stress feels like and what calm feels like and with that knowledge with that self-awareness i was able to notice that throughout the day just working i'd be breathing in a way that's that's basically high stress breathing really high up in my chest all the time yeah and uh, and then and then I also became more aware of my diaphragm, what my diaphragm is doing, which I didn't really have any awareness of that before cold exposure. But yeah, my diaphragm was always sucked up and like, and I was breathing up in my chest. Whereas like relaxed breathing is you got to deep breathe deeper into your belly and your diaphragm drops way down. And then I started adding like just so just general physical physiological stress, trying to just like manage that throughout the day. And then right and then. And then like, it, it, it literally took six, like, I don't want to make it sound too simple now that I'm summarizing my journey, but it mm -hmm. took six years of trying and researching and doing different habits and exercising. Like I was exercising in a way that try to improve the, my ability to move. I really wanted to move freely without pain. So like, yeah. surprisingly, we don't naturally move in a way that's ideal. We just, we move in a way that, that uses the least amount of energy possible so we disproportionately load our joints and not our muscles when we just move without thinking so i had to become more intentional with the way i would, even just walking i had to become more intentional like how i walk right. so that i load my muscles instead of my joints and decrease the pain in my body but what like ultimately after this long period of trying different things and being very committed to all these habits it was ultimately a fast that gave my body that reset to yeah. and then from that point on that's when I started producing my own homes I felt different once I I broke that fast and then and I felt strong and healthy and I was like so then when I had my hormones retested I didn't I didn't continue with the hormones because I felt good I felt strong and then right. sure enough my, my hormones were in a normal range despite no longer taking my hormone therapy so the, 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 it was a long many years of being consistent to these healthy habits, but I just need some sort of a reset for my body just to be able to be okay again with basically producing my own hormones. So that's what that fast seemed to have done for me. It was a real, it was a biological reset. Right. That's amazing. That's amazing because a lot of people don't realize that you could do it naturally by changing your lifestyle, by changing the way you eat, by changing your sleeping habits, by a whole cocktail of, of different ways of, of living. And just by changing all those things that you could actually reset the way your hormones are, are, are. And that actually opens up the doors because when you have low testosterone, you're, you're very fatigued. You're very sluggish. You know, some people don't even have enough of strength to get out of bed. That's how weak it makes you. And, you know, it, it can really damper your, your whole entire life. You know, when your hormones aren't balanced, it just throws everything off. And, um, you know, that's amazing that you were able to actually balance them. It shows how powerful the you know, the holistic living is, you know. Uh, the one quote that I really hung on to in that six year period was that, the best health secret in medicine is that under the right conditions, your body can heal itself. Yes. And that's so very true. That, that is very true. You know, they, they said, you know, a lot of people believe food for medicine because it was, you know, there's so many nutrients in so many, you know, healthy foods that if you consistently put good food in your, your body, a lot of the nutrients can help heal the body also. That's right. Yeah. And um, yeah, that, that's what Hippocrates said back in 400 BC is that the let food be thy medicine. And I feel like we've lost sight of that in recent years. And that's why now all the, the leading causes of death are either partially or completely preventable through yes. lifestyle. And people don't realize how much impact and how much control they really have or can have over their health if they listen to hypocrites, Hippocrates. And mm -hmm. uh, let food be medicine.
Right. You know, there are so many people that they just go to the doctor, the doctor gives them a pill, they take the medication, they start getting side effects. So they go back to the doctor and the doctor gives them another medication to override the side effect that they're getting from the first medication. And then they're starting to feel better, but new side effects are occurring. Then they go back to the doctor and the doctor gives them another prescription. Before you know it, they have a pharmacy in their, in their bathroom and they're not, you know, and some of those medications can interact with each other and it can slow down people, give them joint pain. There's lots of things that could happen and people don't feel their best. And by, by trying to do things more naturally, you know, sometimes you do need medication, but in other instances, there are a lot of things that can be done naturally to avoid taking all those medications that have harsh side effects. That's right. And, and I, I, like you speak of, of like naturally healing. And then one of the things that put my mind to ease in increasing the amount of animal foods in my diet is I started thinking about what is our natural diet? What do we naturally eat as homo sapiens? Yeah. And so that, that's one of the things that put my mind at ease. I'm, I personally have always been a fan of human evolution mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of lessons to learn in, human evolution and even if you don't believe in evolution uh, as a whole the the lessons are still there because there are these hominids that are in the fossil records are still the most similar to humans yes. out of out of all the hominids so like it's there's still valuable lessons in the fossil records if you yes. don't believe in evolution so when i looked at the the research that's there based off of like where humans came from um, I started realizing how big uh, a role animal foods really spent, really played in making humans humans. Right. So there is like the um, Homo habilis is one of the first, it's like the first group of hominids with the name Homo. And basically they were, they were famous for uh, being the, the first uh, group with that had evidence of making tools so they would have used the tools for doing things that, that help with scavenging that help them break the bones over open eat the bone marrow eat the mm -hmm. brains or that, that other animals wouldn't be able to get at so that's really a, a point in our in a in um in the fossil records where the the consumption of meat really started to increase yeah. and and with every step where we saw evidence of increased meat consumption there was a coinciding increase in the size of their brains oh really so the homo habilis had a much larger brain than um earlier hominids or earlier um apes or something like that that were in the fossil records and that's along with the evidence of them using tools to eat bone marrow and then yeah the the, the transitions are kind of gray of like when homo habilis turned into homo erectus but mm -hmm. they start seeing more more signs of the also using these tools maybe potentially for hunting. Wow. But Homo erectus was unique in that that's when they started seeing clear evidence of them hunting in groups. And that's like a, a more recent in the fossil records is like that you really start seeing true evidence of them using tools and, and hunting in groups. So like, because they're actively not just scavenging, but going out and yeah. actually killing in, and hunting the meat consumption increased dramatically and once again along with that so did the size of their brains right and that similar trend continued through the homo neanderthals which are very similar to us just maybe a little more adapted to the cold and then homo sapiens with more and more meat consumption and larger and larger brains and that trend continued up until ten thousand years ago when all of a sudden there's a massive drop off in the size of our brains yeah. and our overall stature dropped off dramatically, the 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 health of our teeth and just and they can see just like on injuries and stuff on the bones and stuff that we weren't healing properly, like mm -hmm. it was it, all of a sudden around ten thousand years ago there's a massive was, if you look over this the if you look at in a graph there's a constant increase with brain size and meat consumption. And all of a sudden there's a massive drop off in brain size 10,000 years ago. Wow. And that was when the agricultural revolution began. 
and all of a sudden we moved away from hunting and we moved towards um growing our wheat and developing more crops and basically we we massively increased the amount of plant foods in our diet and massively decreased the amount of meat in our diet mm. so we we were able to get lots of calories doing this way and it would be reliable calories and we wouldn't have to travel as far but as a consequence these 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 we became deficient in lots of nutrients because there's not as bioavailable we moved away from what we were eating for for two and a half million three million years and moved right. towards eating far more plants and, and over time like to more recent days our stature and, and our, our and, and our health has improved because we found ways of processing these foods that we were able to basically digest them better they, they'd be more available through cooking and through fermenting like if you have your instead of just eating and smashing up your wheat if you if you ferment your wheat and you break it down to a powder and you and then you cook it and like all those steps improve the digestibility and the and of, of that food so over yeah. time we have we've we've regained a lot of our stature and a lot of our height and a lot of our health by through processing these plant foods and and like if you look like at the tallest populations though in modern times most of those have significant amounts of animal products in their diet yeah like if you the tribes like the the maasai in africa like they're eating they're eating lots of meat blood and, and dairy and that's the that's the majority of their diet and they're some of the tallest people um if you look at like the northern europe like the scandinavian countries a lot of huge viking type people there that yeah. they we consume a lot of meat and dairy because like you're way up north and there's not as many plant foods available seasonally. Right. So then, so those are some really big people, but then also like where I come from, I, I was born in, in Holland and um, it's the, considered the tallest country in the world, but there was actually a time in Europe where the Dutch were actually the shortest people in Europe. Oh, really? Um, like the mid 19th century where all of a sudden, our average height increased by 20 centimeters. We also jumped in height and became the tallest country in the world. And right. that through basically like, if you look at what we eat, like what I grew up eating and what is typically eaten, it's, it's a lot of dairy, a lot of cheese yeah. and, and a lot of milk. So like, that's really helped that, that those animal foods that are highly digestible nutrients, especially when you're young, really helps help you grow to your genetic potential. And there, there's there's more evidence of that. Like um, before colonization in North America, the Plains Indians were amongst the tallest people in the world. And what were they eating? These they they were basically eating mostly buffalo. That's yeah. the their preferred food source of these Plains Indians. But now they're they're no longer amongst the tallest people because they're they've basically moved to a more Western style diet. Right. And if you, and and it's a trend like. Of, of in in like the um the plant based community the in the vegan diet. Unfortunately, there's not too many people that did it the way I try to do, where like I eat nothing but whole foods. Typically, it go it coincides. People that eat a vegan diet also eat a highly processed diet. They eat more processed foods. Oh, really? On average, than people that also consume meat. And I feel like a part of that is just like you're your body wants those more digestible nutrients. Yeah. It's craving like that. Something, something a little more nutrient or calorie dense, not necessarily nutrient dense. Right. But yeah, so like uh, all those cravings are, are, are improved when you, when you look at like just eating enough, enough animal products as well. Um, and then figuring out where, where the ideal spot is for you for, as far as consuming that. But then, yeah. And if you look at, more evidence in the, in the fossil records. There's something called um, nitrogen isotope. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's different types of nitrogen that are heavier than others. Yeah. And over time they break down and they break down in a, in a predictable way. But you can look at, like there's a, a natural amount of, of this heavier type of nitrogen in the environment. So when, when you have animals that eat plants, they eat a certain amount of this heavier nitrogen, this nitrogen isotope. And a certain amount of that of that, that concentration in is in their bones. 
they 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 eat it from the plants this this type of nitrogen and it gets concentrated in their bones and you can find the amount of nitrogen isotopes in their bones today wow so you you can look at nitrogen isotopes and like, and then carnivores or the animals that eat those plant animals, they have more of this nitrogen isotopes in their bones because they're not just eating the plants. They're eating the, the plant eaters that ate the plants. So is th that nitrogen isotopes, it bioaccumulates and they ha they're eating far more of this nitrogen isotopes than the plant eater ate. So the carnivores um, in that period, they would have far more of this nitrogen isotope in their bones. So you can look and see approximately in comparison to the other animals, how much animal product, how much meat did different species eat? So if you look at like the wild horse, they had a, yeah. they had a relatively lower level of this nitrogen isotope. But if you look at the Arctic fox, right. it was up north and it's basically eating nothing but meat. It's, 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 a, it's a carnivore. So it had a much higher level of this stable nitrogen isotope in their bones. Yeah. If you look at they like this this study, they looked at four different groups of Homo sapiens before agriculture, before the agricultural revolution. So yeah. more than ten thousand years ago, if they look at the population of humans and they looked at their bones, their nitrogen isotope levels were even higher than the fox. Wow. So so based off of those results, that would classify pre-agriculture humans as hyper carnivores because they didn't just eat the plant eaters, they mm -hmm. ate the carnivores. So they were, they were concentrating all of those nitrogen isotopes into their bones. So yeah. like, it's clear based off the nitrogen isotope data as well that humans ate a significant amount of animal products, a significant amount of meat. And right. if you really think, like a lot of the fruits and vegetables that we eat today most of them didn't exist a few thousand years ago. Right. We created a majority of them. There and then and then even so like the ones that were available back then before uh we before we we bred them to be basically more calorically dense or more or bigger or more beautiful or whatever, we selected them for what traits that we wanted. A lot of those foods, they are they'll they won't be as tasty. They won't be as there won't be as many calories in there. They and there would be way more anti nutrients in there as well. And we right. just, over the over thousands and thousands of years, we bred that to to have be more digestible, less anti nutrients, more cal more calories, and then yes. basically completely unrecognizable of where a lot of these foods originally came from, like corn, right. the grass, like the grains are huge now. But they yeah. wouldn't have that back before agriculture. So right. if you really what would our ancestors have eaten preferentially in their environment when they're hunting and gathering? They'll have some fruit maybe, but the 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 calories in fruit even back then was much, much lower, like basically crab apples and, and some berries. And really the most caloric dense food that they had available to them was yeah. meat. So that's what they obviously preferentially ate back then and then and then uh but then still they still despite the fact they still had a lot of fiber in their diet like you can look at um fossilized poop from humans and they still had lots of fiber in their diet so like i don't think it's necessarily arguable that we were omnivorous right just under, but like we definitely preferred eating those animal products so, so like we definitely and then and that we've been preferring those foods for up to three million years so like that is the foundation of our of our evolution of our or the foundation of our body is eating animal-based foods so right like that that really put my mind at ease as far as like consuming a significant amount of animal products and beyond that one of the main concerns that people will have when they're eating these more animal products is especially if you eat a significant amount like I do, um, you'll you'll notice that typically your cholesterol levels will increase. Mm -hmm. And um, cholesterol has been demonized for a long time as being one of the, the causes of heart disease. And heart disease is a leading cause of death. So there's been, there's a, there's been a, a real push historically to lower cholesterol levels in, in attempts to lower our heart disease risk. Right. 
Fortunately, despite us lowering, lowering our animal fat consumption and trying to lower cholesterol and having low cholesterol lowering drugs, mm -hmm. our heart disease risk is doing nothing but increase. Yes. Like we're better at treating heart disease and intervening and keeping people alive. But if you actually look at how many people are getting heart disease, it's con constantly increasing. Yes. So obviously it's not working. Right. Humanizing cholesterol is not working. And the reason is cholesterol is involved in the formation of plaques in our body. And that and then the release of those plaques can lead to heart disease or stroke. The cholesterol is not necessarily the root cause of plaque formation. So your cholesterol is what your body uses to try to patch up all sorts of damage or irritation in your blood vessels. In your right. Blood. So just because it's basically, I, I like to um, compare cholesterol to a police officer mm -hmm. at a crime scene. So just because there's always a police officer at a crime scene does not mean that it's the police officer that caused the crime. Right. So the cholesterol is always present in the formation of plaques and, and atherosclerosis, but it's not the cholesterol is what your body is trying to do to heal the damage. The actual root cause of, of atherosclerosis is the damage and the irritation. Mm -hmm. So that's what you need to try to prevent. And, so like you might think, okay, so cholesterol is not an issue. I can just ignore cholesterol. Well, no, you shouldn't ignore cholesterol because cholesterol is only not an issue if you don't have that damage and irritation in your blood vessels. Right. That's when cholesterol is no, no longer an issue. And you, you can predict whether you have that by whether or not you're metabolically healthy. Mm -hmm. And you, you can like... You, people define metabolic health by basically like your weight, your height to waist ratio, your overall weight. Yeah. And also like your, your blood glucose levels, your fasting blood glucose and your blood pressure and your like hemoglobin A1C, the amount of, um, of what is that? The um, glycation of your hemoglobin, the sugar mm -hmm. balance hemoglobin if you measure those things you can predict whether or not you're metabolically healthy and unfortunately only 12 percent of the population can be considered metabolically healthy yeah and so only those 12 percent really don't need to worry about cholesterol because like if you even though cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease if you have a damaged arteries the cholesterol, if you get rid of that cholesterol, it still won't cause, it'll still improve your atherosclerosis. It'll still prevent the, the development of plaques. Right. Like people who have damage, it is still beneficial to lower their cholesterol if they have that damage and irritation. Right. But you're much better off. Just be healthy. Don't yeah. have that damage. Don't have that irritation. And then you can you can use, the, you know, then you don't need to worry about your cholesterol levels. And then you can really just like, just eat what your body craves and desires. Yes. And uh, yeah, so like, so that there's actually a, a research study that came out very recently um, by Dave Feldman. And he looked at people with incredibly high cholesterol levels, but they refuse, but refuse to take statins and try refuse to take the drugs to lower those cholesterol levels. Yes. And these people were eating a very high fat diet, a lot, a lot, a lot of animal products, but they refused to take these drugs. So they were the perfect candidates to, to research. And these people were, uh, are, were matched with other people who have normal cholesterol levels. They were matched for things like smoking and for weights and stuff like that. And, once they did that, they realized that the people that were metabolically healthy, there was absolutely no correlation between cholesterol and heart disease. They were measuring yeah. not just the, the hard uh, plaque in your blood vessels, but also the soft plaque. Like the hard plaque is not as dangerous. It's fairly stable. Mm -hmm. The soft is what poses a risk of breaking loose and then right. causing it further on down the line. So it's, but they, and most people or most tests only measure your, your hard plaque, your, mm -hmm. uh, your calcified plaque. Yes. Whereas it, uh, in this study, they were, they were looking at both mm -hmm. and no increased development of atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis or plaque formation 
with these people with crazy high cholesterol levels. Yeah. And that's very recent. And that's a, it's still an ongoing study. They're going to follow these people over time and continue doing these scans and looking for any progression. But yeah, I think that's proof of like that, that cholesterol is more nuanced than people uh, seem to describe on the internet. Cholesterol in of itself is not bad. It's only bad if you had that damage and irritation in your blood vessels. Right. So like the next logical question is, well, how do you prevent the damage and irritation? Mm -hmm. And that's through things like you, you want to avoid those highly, that highly processed junk. You want yes. any preservatives and stuff like that, that'll all cause stress and irritation, inflammation in your body. You want to avoid foods like, like me, I had to avoid pasteurized dairy because it was causing inflammation. I was reacting to it. That's, that's, that's all that, that immune response. That's all inflammation and irritation. Yes. And, and also like the, the huge waves and different differentiations in uh, our blood glucose levels. Like your body really wants a stable glu blood glucose levels. Um, any sort of um, variation like is, is very toxic to your body. That's why diabetes is so damaging because your body is no longer able to um, manage the your, your blood glucose levels. So it gets right. too high. And it's very damaging for your body. It causes, it binds to all sorts of different things in your body and decreases your ability for your body to work. That's the glycation. It's sugar binding to yeah. like your movement into enzymes and cells and everything. You want to avoid that glycation. Right. So, but um, so when you, when you actually look at like what that, that huge increase if you have like a highly processed carbohydrate like you're eating your white bread and your white rice and whatever else or you're, you're then you have a huge spike in sugars and then you have a huge spike in insulin and then you crash because your insulin is so high you're you're you you crash and then you have a, a really low blood glucose levels too low and then your body craves more sugars then you have right. the next piece of highly processed carbohydrate and you just keep going on this this wacky cycle and that's damaging your arteries as well. That's a lot of irritation as well. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. You made such great points. Very good points. You know, I, I think a lot of people aren't, you know, um, don't realize a lot of those things. You know, you, you just read a lot of articles on the internet and they don't hear about the soft plaque versus the hard plaque. And they don't realize, you know, that the hard plaque isn't the bad one. And, you know, and a lot of the studies that are done, because when you go onto the internet, you know, you, you, every article is written by someone who is biased in a certain way. And so you have a lot of cross information and it can get very confusing. So you made very, very good points. Very good points. Now, if you had to take all the information that we went over today and you had to summarize it, what type of things would you like to emphasize to people? Eat whole foods and eat a natural diet. Yeah. And then the last one would be like, don't be dogmatic about your diet. That's, it's not a religion. It's, it's fuel for your body. Yeah. So just don't be afraid to try within the rule of eating whole foods. Just try for yourself. Where does you, where, what kind of diet makes your body feel best? Right. Very, that's a very good point. You know, you have to really go at what makes your body feel best. Everybody is different. Now, if people want to find more information about you, where can they go? Yeah, if you visit our website, um, that's uh, a lot of information is there from about our farm and what we're doing on our farm to um, try to improve animal welfare and, and further regenerative agriculture. But also there's a lot of resources there for finding out more information. Like there's links to podcasts like this one will be on our, on the, uh, on their website. And then there's also links to our, our social media and also there's a, a, an email info at more elites there that you can email if you have any questions and I read those emails directly. And also like uh, there's a, a chance that you can, you can sign up to our email list. And if you do, and you live in Ontario, you sign up to that email list, you can be, you're automatically entered to win a sample box where you can try all of our products. So that's our website is where, it's, where you can find all that information. And that's the, basically the best way. It's amazing. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful, Sander. I love having you on the show. You always have such great information to provide. 
And I love the topics that you talk about. You know, you 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 talk about a lot of different different types of health um, issues and products and and ideas. And you you do a great job really getting the message across to people and making people see things from a wider point of view, kind of out of the box, so to speak. So thank you so much. I appreciate today and, and having you come on the show. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. You have a great day. You too.